want to go to Capitol Please. Hill, Senator from Kentucky, member of the Foreign Relations Committee, Rand Paul. Senator, good morning. Good to see you. Good morning. We are going to get to health care <laughs> in just a moment, but first want to get your reaction to the words Senator John McCain had for <laughs> you from the Senate floor yesterday. Let's listen. I note this, the, the senator from Kentucky here. leaving the floor without justification or, rather, or any rationale for the action that he has just taken. That is really remarkable, that a senator blocking a treaty that is supported by the overwhelming number, perhaps 98 at least, of his colleagues would come to the floor and object and walk away and walk away. The only conclusion you can draw when he walks away is he has no argument to be made. He has no justification for his objection to having a small nation be part of NATO that is under assault from the Russians. So I repeat again, the senator from Kentucky is now working for Vladimir Putin. Oh so, what? Senator, a little context, wow. uh, context around what? that. The, the vote was around putting uh, Montenegro into NATO. What's your reaction to Senator McCain's characterization of your objection? Well, you know, I think he makes a really, really strong case, you know, for term limits. Um, I think maybe he's uh, past his prime. I think maybe he's gotten a little bit unhinged. I do oh, think Lord, that... Yeah. Uh, I do think that when we talk about NATO, there can be a rational discussion about the pros and cons of expanding it. We currently have uh, troops, combat troops in about six nations. We have uh, troops actively just stationed in probably a couple dozen others. We have a $20 trillion debt. And one of my favorite articles of the last couple of years was one that talked about the angry McCains. And if, they, if we put active troops and got involved in combat where McCain wants us to be, they put a little angry McCain on the globe, on the map, and it's virtually everywhere. So his foreign policy is something that would greatly endanger the United States, greatly overextend us. And there has to be the thought whether or not it's in our national interest to pledge to get involved with war if, if Montenegro has a, an altercation with anyone. There's also another argument is that when you ask the people of Montenegro, only about 40% or slightly less are actually in favor of this. They are close to Russia. They're close to being sort of like Ukraine in the transition from Europe to Asia. Perhaps it would be good to be like Switzerland and be more neutral and trade with both. Mm. Uh, so there's a lot of considerations, but to call someone uh, somehow an enemy of the state or a traitor uh, might be considered by most reasonable people to be a little over the top. Well, Senator, you just called John McCain unhinged. You said he was past his prime. Why do you think so many other senators have voted in favor of this measure if it's so crazy? <laughs> I think that there is a bipartisan consensus that's incorrect that we should have the whole world in NATO. For example, if we had Ukraine and Georgia in NATO, and this is something McCain and the other neocons have advocated for, uh, we would be at war now. Uh, because Russia has invaded both of them. And so I think having former uh, satellites or former parts of the Soviet Union in NATO is very provocative. And you have to decide in advance whether you're ready to go to war. If you guys are ready to send a million troops into Ukraine and uh, fight World War III, uh, you're going to do it without my support because I think that's a really foolish notion. Do you think, Senator, places like Albania and Croatia then should have been allowed into NATO in 2009? I think it's a real debate how big NATO should be and whether or not uh, it's been more provocative than good. And uh, there's also the debate that the president brought up throughout the campaign, and that is um, we seem to be paying for all of it. Whenever there's a war fought, our soldiers fight it and our dollars pay for it. And so the 45 soldiers that uh, Montenegro has, I think, are hardly an asset to our national security. And really, our decisions need to be about our national security. And so I just don't think it enhances our national security to have Montenegro part of NATO. Rick Stengel, having worked in the State Department um, all these years and under the Obama administration, what do you make of NATO expansion for some, a country like Montenegro? Yeah, I would, I would ask the senator, do you, what, what, what countries would you actually take out of NATO that NATO expanded? And I think it's a perfectly valid argument to make to say that NATO has expanded too much. But, I mean, maybe there's a, a second tier in NATO. I, I'd be curious to see how, what, would you, what senator, how you would do it differently. I guess I would reverse the argument and ask you the question, you know, do you think Ukraine and Georgia being in NATO are good for our national defense? 
I think it's a ridiculous notion. And the same people that want Montenegro, they also want Ukraine and Georgia. And they better think it through and ask the American people. And I guarantee if you ask the American people, are you ready to march tomorrow to support Montenegro? Are you ready to march tomorrow? Are you ready to send your dollars? Because none of these nations actually pay even close to their 2%. Are you ready to fight and die for Montenegro, Ukraine, uh, Georgia? I think the people uh, really, I think if we're asked for that question, I think you'd find that many more would side with me than with the so-called bipartisan consensus up here that has spent us into oblivion and obligated us to fight everyone else's war. Senator, I'd say there's a little bit of a false choice there in terms of comparing Montenegro to Ukraine. Ukraine is a country the size of France in the middle of Europe. Uh, there are many, many Ukrainian Under Americans. Siege. There are people who would actually would actually fight and die for Ukraine in America, but might not do so for Montenegro. Uh, and I, I would not prevent anybody from volunteering to fight in a uh, war in Ukraine. I would not uh, conscript or send our soldiers there. I don't think it's in U.S. national interest to have our soldiers in there and say that this is our war. And uh, yes, the same people who want Montenegro, this is not the same battle, but it's the same people. And we have not yet had the battle. We've had some battles, and probably I was the one who unilaterally stopped them from rushing Georgia in a couple years ago. And uh, I look at that as that maybe I've saved thousands of Americans' lives from being lost in a country that is of no national security interest to the United States. Okay, Senator Paul, can we turn to health care um, and speaking, <laughs> speaking <laughs> as both a physician yourself and as a senator, um, when you look at what the debate that is going on in the House and the White House's efforts to push through the Republican plan in the House, how much does that plan have to change, do you think, to get through the Senate? Yeah, I think there's a lot of Republican unity. There's a lot of agreement on repeal. In fact, it's one of the things that's brought us together more than any other issue over the last six years. But there really isn't a great deal of unity over uh, Paul Ryan's replacement plan. In fact, it is sort of false for him to go around saying, oh, you guys ran on my plan. The heck we did. We've been running on repeal, Paul, for years and years, but nobody was running on, oh, we'll give you half as many uh, subsidies, half as many taxes, and instead of paying the individual mandate to the government, you have to pay it to the insurance company. None of us ran on that. No conservative is for his plan. And so I think his plan's dead on arrival. My hope is it never leaves the House. Hmm. And my hope is that we separate repeal from replace because, you know, there's some great ideas that could have bipartisan support. I've been talking to Democrats all week about let's have buying groups. Let's say, you know, AARP has 37 million people. What if we let them become a buying group? Can you imagine the leverage they would have with insurance companies? companies to force prices down. I want to see lower prices, but I don't want just to see Obamacare light. It will not bring down prices and it will be back stuck in the same situation we're in about a year from now with less people with, in with insurance and higher premiums. The one problem with, uh, with this is if this plan is deeply flawed, as many are concerned it is, and something, this president wants a win. And I don't, no, I'm not sure he's concerned with just exactly what's in it, as long as it's a win. Would anyone agree with that contention? I would agree with that. I, yeah. um, I don't know that he knows the details. I, um, he might, I think he's certainly concerned with not having a loss. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Which makes the job for Republicans and Democrats even harder, because we don't want to rip health care away from people who need it, do we? Is there anybody, Rand Paul, any Republican who really wants to do that to their constituents? Well, Senator. Well, I think that uh, in, under, in order to understand how to fix something, you have to understand what's wrong with the current system. What's wrong with the current system is mostly in the individual market. Group insurance is largely working okay in a country. But if you are a plumber or a pest control business and it's you and your right. spouse, you are worried that you'll get sick and you're worried that your rates are going up and your rates are going up dramatically because we have one fundamental thing that's part of Obamacare that doesn't work. It says that you can get insurance after you're sick. If you say that, you have to force healthy people to get in because they don't want to get in. So you beat them over the head with an individual mandate. But that wasn't enough and didn't work. So the premiums are skyrocketing. If you keep that mandate, but you, you get rid of the individual mandate, but you keep the mandate that says you can buy insurance after you're sick, it will not work. Everybody's mm -hmm. writing it. On the left, you got Krugman saying it. From the center or the right, you got Megan McArdle and others saying this, that it does not work. Insurance premiums will still go through the roof if we 
keep that fundamental premise. But there is a way to protect people. And the way I would protect people is by letting every individual join a group. When you're in group insurance, you're protected against pre-existing conditions, but you also get the leverage of lower prices. Right. Allowing groups mm -hmm. to go across state lines, co-ops. Look, I'm talking to progressive Democrats who are not against co-ops. Some of this stuff originated in Oregon, not exactly a big red state anymore. And so co-ops are a great idea. They're voluntary, but they fix the pre-existing problem and the price problem. We should be talking about that now instead of all. In fact, I would even do that first. And let's see what that does over the next six months to help improve the situation Senator as Ren we work out the final repeal. Senator Ren Paul, thank you very much for being on the Thank show you. This Thanks, Senator. All right. Up next.